I think that India should be a technology powerhouse. It was industrial revolution era stuff that we are carrying and we are still living in knowledge economy now. I totally agree. I try to keep up with all the tech trends, but it's really the people coming out of college today that are going to shape what technology looks like in the future. Leadership is making people feel uncomfortable at a rate that they can absorb. Very excited to be talking to you. I'm super excited to see you as well. Did you see this journey and the institution that it would become today? Look, when we started in 2002, there was no technology ecosystem in Australia. Yeah, like yes. there was, uh, going to work at a startup was really just saying that you were unemployed um, by a different name. And so uh, we didn't want to get a real job. We wanted to work in technology and uh, we just didn't want to have to put a suit on and go to work. And so that was kind of the starting vision for that. And then we realized actually that uh, we could build software from Australia and build a technology company. And our first product was Jira. And uh, we found that that was really successful. And uh, um, we would code through the night uh, building this. And uh, I remember one night we were, it was so cold like that we had to go wash our hands under hot water, like to, you know, go back to our keyboards and, and wow. keep coding. Mm. And so like in the early days, it really is you're doing everything as a, as a founder. And, uh, and then like, you know, 20 years later, we've got 10,000, 11,000 employees. And so it's like yeah. been a pretty crazy journey. What was it about you guys that you took that risk? I think it was that there was no technology industry. We weren't building anything in Australia. Mm. And if I wanted to work in technology, it would have have to be go for a, go to work at a bank and be like a back office mm. function yeah, uh, or go work an insurance agency. Uh, and that wasn't that exciting to me. I wanted to build products to get used by people around the world. And we didn't know what that was going to be. And we didn't know if it was going to be successful. And I don't know, I think when you're 20, the downside risk of starting something is very low because if it failed, I would just go back to sleeping on my, you know, in my parents' house. <laughs> and uh, I was eating, you know, cheap, you know, rice and uh, noodles like for lunch and dinner anyway. So it, it didn't cost a lot of money to do a startup. But we just had this vision that we wanted to build products that people used and we were going to keep trying until we did that. You know, in India, we have a culture that parents are very, very demanding and middle class parents are very demanding that you get a regular job and you earn after your studies. How is it in Australia? Uh, I don't think I told my parents what I was doing for <laughs> a, a long time. Okay. Um, but there is, I, I, there was an employee of ours who uh, worked for us whilst he was at university ah. and he left to go work at another company ah. because um, of uh, his parents who right. wanted him to go work at a company that had a reputation. And uh, he came back because like he realized that it was better to work at a place that had no reputation. And so, and I'm hoping these days that you can go work in technology industry and it's recognized as like being a doctor or a lawyer or an engineer, which are all like very prestigious jobs in Australia. These days, working in technology, I think, is just as prestigious, but it wasn't back 20 years ago. You know, I hope you take, you pause to acknowledge that you would have contributed significantly to that change which has happened. I hope so. I hope yeah. so. We were, and so I think Inmobi was the first technology yes. unicorn here. Yes. And I got to meet with their, their team this week. Uh, we were the first unicorn in Australia. Yeah. And uh, so we've, you know, kind of... Uh, inspired, I think, a whole bunch of other unicorns. And now we have Canva, which is another company from yeah. Australia and a long list of other companies out there. So ho hopefully we've, we've done something. What's your perspective? How are you reading the market? How are you seeing the market? And, 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 and if I had to ask you, how do you see it in the next 10 years? Because we here are quite bullish. I think you should be. Yeah. Uh, um, when I come here, there's this air of opportunity yeah. uh, of, uh, you know, it's, for in technology, there's 4 million software developers here in this country. In Australia, we have 130,000. So there's 30 times more people <laughs> here that can build software. And uh, when I look at what you've got, we, you know, we, I chatted with the uh, founder of Infosys, mm -hmm. like uh, who's still the, the chairman now. And you know, that set off the first wave of uh, yes. you know, tech jobs here. And then there's companies like Inmobi, like who then set off like the second wave and uh, you know, I, could, I think that India should be a technology powerhouse because 
you can build things for your domestic market. You're increasingly building things for the rest of the world in technology. Uh, and I think that's going to be a huge impact like on you know, the economy here. And yeah. people seem really um, uh, aspirational, I think. Like, and people really want to make a difference. And, uh, and people joined Atlassian, um, you know, five years ago, we had nothing. We, zero people here, like, you know, no presence. And we had a whole team that joined us. Like that shows you, I think, that people are willing to take bets and uh, and try something new. And I think if a whole nation is like that, um, that's going to be like a huge thing for for India. Um, you would have taken far more bigger bets to be where you are. But the things we failed at as a company is where we had a great idea, but we didn't actually like put enough people behind it. And mm. so, uh, Slack is pretty well known as a as a company. And we had a product that was similar to that um, before Slack came out with something. And in that product, like we, we had a better product. Uh, we were first to market, like, but we didn't put enough investment behind it. Um, and then eventually we you know, ended up selling our product to Slack and combining forces there. But I think if we'd put like, a lot more emphasis behind it, so invested harder, maybe you know, stopped other things like to mm. invest in, in these new areas, like mm. we would have been more successful than we are today. What's your plan for India, like for the Indian market? I mean, we have 1,700 people here in India. Wow. And uh, we had zero people here five years ago. And uh, we, we won a top 10 best places to work uh, award. We came eighth out of all of India in an, under five years. And that just brings me so much joy that we've like created a place where people do amazing work here. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I don't know, I feel it's great that we can bring these great jobs, you know, to, to India as well. Our vision uh, is for there are more and more products to be built here out of India for the world. Mm -hmm. And we have, uh, you know, we have three markets that we operate in. One of them is for our IT customers. And most of uh, the development or the largest development center for that is here in India. And uh, one of our products in that, in that space is called Status Page and 100% of that is built here in India. And so my vision is that we wanna build more and more world-class you know, products that are used by people here. And we currently have about 250,000 companies using our products, wow. and tens of millions of people. Mm. And uh, our vision is to have 100 million people use our products every single day. And we want India to be a huge part of that. Yeah, I'm sure everyone listening would be very happy. <laughs> I just uh, think there's so much opportunity here, like for India to become a tech powerhouse. Yes. Like, uh, it's, uh, it really is the right time and place for that. You know, you're saying that people can work remotely or from anywhere. And uh, uh, tell us about that. <laughs> Talk to us about that. So we're 100% in on remote and distributed work. So mm -hmm. we've burnt the boats, like we're not going back. Mm -hmm. uh, and in some ways we're the canary in the coal mine. So we're figuring it all out for every company and trying to work out what works and what doesn't. And what that means for, you know, in India is, for example, half of our uh, staff don't live in Bangalore uh, anymore, right? Mm. Like they live somewhere else in the country. And two thirds of the staff that we've hired in India since we had this policy live outside Bangalore. And so, uh, you know, that's sort of what we're, what we're up to now. I believe that if you want to get people back to the office five days a week, you can do that because we got pretty good at it before the pandemic. We've been doing it for maybe 70 years. People yeah. have been coming to offices. Uh, or what I think is better is I think people should better work wherever they feel comfortable to work. Um, a lot of people are doing this middle ground where it's come back to the office two days a week. Yeah. And that doesn't make any sense because like then you turn up to the office, you might commute two hours to the office to sit on a Zoom call then commute yeah. two hours home, yeah. like that doesn't make any sense. Yeah. And so in remote work, we basically say that we still think people need to build bonds, social bonds together. So like, it's not like you never see your colleagues ever. It's saying that you need to see them every single day to build those social bonds. And so we get people together with what, what we call intentional togetherness. Mm. And when we get those people together, it's not just sit next to each other on a laptop and do work all day. It's like, how do you build social bonds? How do you break bread? We often do it giving back to uh, philanthropy and our foundation and helping the community. Uh, we do it with social events. And so we intentionally bring together people together to build social bonds. And then people go back to where they, where they live and then they get their work done. And we think that's the best of, of all worlds. And um, some, some advantages are 
um, there's a, a woman who works for us who has limited four hours a day of commuting through Bangalore. Yeah. Like, and she still lives in Bangalore. She comes to the office, you know, a couple of times a month, but saves four hours a day that, you know, she can then spend with her kids and family and has moved, you know, to the edges and outskirts of town. Uh, there's a woman who works for us whose husband's in the military and he moves around every two years. And yeah. so she used to have to get a new job every two years when she moved around. But now she's going to stay with Atlassian yeah. and still work around the country. So I think that companies are going to struggle to get people back into the office. And I think our ability to basically then, you know, hire people in rural areas around the country is just is, is enormous. And then we provide these incredible jobs to people living in small villages, not just people living in big cities. We've doubled our female participation in our workforce since we allowed people to work from anywhere. So we've doubled the percentage of women who work for Atlassian in India because people can work from wherever they want. So that's made a huge difference. Do you think it becomes a little easier to work remotely than in services? I, I can only talk about product industries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, but I think that, uh, I don't know that you need to get to, I mean, obviously if you, you know, some jobs can't be done remotely. If yeah. you work at a restaurant or you're a nurse yeah. or, you know, a firefighter, you can't sort of choose to do that from your house. But so many jobs can be done. If you're turning up to a computer most days and sitting on a laptop or a computer, I don't, it doesn't really matter what work you do. You can most likely do that work from, from anywhere. Yeah, you know, I just think philosophically, it was industrial <laughs> revolution era stuff that we are carrying and we're still living in knowledge economy now. I, I totally agree. Yeah. Like if you actually go back, when I say we've been offices for 70 years, like before that we had, you know, a before the industrial revolution particularly, where we had factories, but factories, you got people together yeah. because you literally the factory, you know, you needed literally passing things down a production line. That's what got people together. And we continued that for offices. And it's only now we've got technology, you know, once you've got Zoom and internet, you can separate people, but you go back even further. Before that, we lived in small towns and villages and we had a great life, uh, you know, an agrarian society. Yes. Like, and so with it, sitting in a chair for 12 hours a day is a relatively recent, phenomenon right like really like our, our, our parents or our grandparents were the first people to ever do that when did you start thinking investing in culture we had about 50 employees our first 50 employees we in, we interviewed and we hired like me and mike my co-founder we hired them all individually and so mm. we were heavily involved in finding mm. the first 50. and the second 50 we said all right well you go hire them now so mm. we weren't as involved in hiring the second 50 people and what we found is that the second 50 people we hired didn't seem the same. Like they didn't seem that they were joining Atlassian for the right reasons. It, it felt like they were here because we had, you know, free beer on a Friday night and we had a you know, ping pong table in the office and they were there for the fun and that aspect about it, but they didn't care about our mission and what we did and how we worked. And so back in say about 2006, uh, we did an exercise where we created Atlassian values. Mm. And we have five Atlassian values. And if you walk around our office and ask anyone, people can name all five. Like it really is a big thing. And our values have swear words in them. Uh, and so for a lot of people that, you know, it either attracts you, wow, well, that's a, a reverent company that you can, you know, feel like that's a great place to work or it repels people. And, and that's great, that's totally fine. You know, some people don't, aren't the type of people we want yeah. to attract here. And so that's been there for what that's like almost you know 17 years ago yeah. uh, that we did that and we hang those on the wall and if you um, talk to our employees one of the reasons they join us is that we're a very values-led organization and it's really important to people uh, to uphold those values and a lot of it's you know one of them is open company no bullshit and so it's about mm. being transparent and open and like you know saying it like it is and a lot of people um uh, you know, here in India really appreciate that value, actually. Yes. Like, it is something that they really, really like. And so um, I go through all of them, but, like, uh, the values really speak to people here. Yeah. And the values don't change. Yeah. Um, so I say that values are what you hold true and culture is how work gets done. Yeah. And so the values stay the same. They, stay, they can stay the same for 100 years. But the way work gets done at a company, that changes every day. And a 10-person company gets work done in a certain way. But a thousand person company gets work done in a totally different way, in a yeah. 10,000 person company. And when COVID happened, work got done in a totally different way. And when we chose not to come back to the office. And so culture evolves like, and has to change over time to be relevant. But the things we all hold true, like the fundamental yeah. things 
don't change. And so I talk to a lot of startup founders who, you know, sort of think the culture shouldn't change, like, you know, and it has to evolve, it has to, has to change. Do you know the five values? How did you guys come up with? So there's a, a book um, that Jim Collins wrote mm. called, I think it's Good to Great was mm. the book. And in it, he talks about a mission to Mars exercise. And if you actually search for Jim Collins' mission to Mars in Google, you'll find a PDF that explains what I'm about to say. And the exercise about finding your values is really saying, well, what, what do you as an organization value today? And it's not, it's not aspirational. It's not what would you like to be. It's like, what, what are you today? Yeah. And you do an exercise where you say, if you were going to recreate your company on Mars and it was going to feel the same and it was going to have like the same tenants, uh, like you're obviously not doing the same job because it's not about building software. We probably don't need software on Mars. We need houses and, you know, uh, spacecraft yeah. and so forth. But we want it to feel the same. And then you say, well, which people would you take on your spacecraft, uh, spacecraft across to Mars? And you can pick 10 people. Who would you pick from your organization? And it's often not the senior leaders, it's the, you know, the people that are going to be the cultural champions who are really mm. going to create that company again in another time and place. Yeah. And then you do that exercise and you then step back and say, why did we choose these people? And, uh, you know, we, one of our um, uh, values is be the change you seek. And when we looked at the people we had chosen, we were like, why, why did we choose these people? Because they're always trying to make change. They're always like active. They're always trying to improve Alassian. And so that became one of our one mm. of our values. And so I would I don't think it's uh, I reckon by the time you're 100 or 200 people in an organization, you should have a set of values by that stage. Like you've got enough people and you know what's important to you. Uh, I think every company should have values at that stage. What are some of the things that you did to see or to have a check on yourself that you're also constantly evolving and growing and, and, and taking the right decisions? If you ask people about Mike and myself uh, as leaders, so I have a co-founder and the two yeah, of us who run yeah. the company, uh, I think people would say we're intensely curious mm. and we really want to understand things. And also uh, we're intensely curious for the truth. And so we don't believe we have the right answer. Yeah. Um, we might have opinions and hypothesis, but we really want to get to the truth about something. And I think being intensely curious has a few benefits because uh, you always believe, you know, you don't know the, the answer because <laughs> like someone, there may be a better answer out mm, there. Yeah. You're always trying to improve yourself because yeah. like you're trying to learn. And for me, that was reading books. I read every business book that could be out there, every programming book, every software book, anything that was, that could help me. I read, uh, you know, intensely. Uh, and then the other part about being curious was to be curious about myself and really understanding myself because I think too many people in life, it's easy to go through life and, um, and yeah. not really understand yourself, whether that's what makes you excited, what makes you sad, when you're excited and sad. Like, I, I know I had to go through that journey myself to really understand, you know, emotions and so forth and, and understand that. So I don't know, I think being intensely curious is, is like the biggest thing I in, encourage uh, startup founders. You know, the ability to take, uh, you know, different hard decisions diminishes, right? Because things are working. Uh, how have you refrained from falling into that trap? I fervently believe um, that companies calcify. Like it's very easy to basically do one thing well and just keep doing that yes. well for years. And you have to actively fight that. And there's very few companies that change too much. Like most inertia is a really like hard thing to fight against. And so everything I do and say is encouraging people to change Atlassian. Um, right where we're sitting right now, I had our graduates here and we have mm. like, hundreds of graduates that were sitting here and I encourage them that their job is to come in and break Atlassian to change it to improve it um, because people want to work in a company where they're empowered to make decisions and make change and so I guess that goes to me as well it's like good what made us successful today is not what's going to keep making us successful in the future and I don't know what's going to make us successful in the future but it's going to be different and uh, if I have the approach that We've got to keep doing the same things like we're going to fail at some stage in the future and it's going to be really hard at that day at that stage so we've got to make plenty of decisions today how do you empower people uh, to participate so part of it I, I what i want to do and i tell all my employees this is that i want you to do your best work of your life here at atlassian 
And in fact, I want you to do it so much that when you leave Atlassian, if you ever do, I want to ruin you so that you can <laughs> never work anywhere else like in your career. Like, wherever mm. else you go, you'll be disappointed because you won't have achieved as much and had as much fun as working at Atlassian. And I remind people of that every day because it takes someone's manager and it takes each each, each person at Atlassian to, to yeah. make it a great environment, not not just Mike and myself. And and so we tell everyone that their job is to come in and make a difference at Atlassian. And so we want to make sure there's nothing that is um, sacred. There's nothing that like can't be touched. Um, there's no decision that like is off limits here mm. at Atlassian. Um, we also give young people incredible responsibility because I think that, uh, you know, I'm old and gray now. I've been doing this for 20 years. Uh, I try to keep up with all the tech trends, but it's really the people coming out of college today. They are going to shape what technology looks like in the future. Maybe it's all virtual reality and like they're going to grow up, you know, with that being native, you know, I, I'm going to be a, like a, have to learn it later in life. Um, but they're going to be native to that. And so we give those young people incredible responsibilities as well. Uh, so I see founders out there who try and again, own every decision at, at the top. And that doesn't scale. That works fine for 50 or 100 people, but we have we have 11,000 people, mm. uh, and like it just doesn't work. We need to really find great people and tell them their job is to run Atlassian. How do you retain the hustle of the startup? I, I read something recently that said leadership is making people feel uncomfortable at a rate that they can absorb. Mm. And I think uh, a lot of us is basically stretching people at Atlassian to do things that they couldn't do otherwise. And the great thing is that with you know, 1,700 people here in, uh, in India, collectively, we can do stuff that one person couldn't do or 10 people couldn't do, 100. Like, so collectively, we get to, to do that. And my job as a leader is basically to push everyone 20% more than they thought was possible uh, themselves. And so partly that's to inspire people. And uh, for us, it's not just building products for you know, a global audience out of India, it's then inspiring other companies in India to do similar. Yeah. It's doing Team Anywhere and it's inspiring other companies to allow their employees to work from anywhere. And so, so one part is like inspiring people and then the other part is pushing people to do more than they thought w was possible. Awesome. And uh, that's hard sometimes because it can be demanding to be that person that just wants more and more out of people. But at the end of the day, like it's really rewarding when people come back and we're like, ah, oh, I did my best work, but like only because you pushed me. Two things I'm told close to you are philanthropy and climate. Uh, tell me what you're doing and, and tell me what you're doing through Atlassian. Yeah, I'll spend most of the time on philanthropy. Uh, so in Atlassian, we have a Atlassian Foundation and we started that even before we had Atlassian values. And so we, very early on decided that we'd come from a privileged upbringing like you know in Australia we had a great education system benefit of all the things um, that our society gave to us and we wanted to give back mm. at an early stage and so we originally pledged one percent of our product um, so we gave our products away for free um, one percent of our uh, profit oh very, very like, early on. very early when on, did you do like, this 2002 three four uh, maybe four or five something wow. like that so wow. two or three years in um, we gave our, our product our profit employee time um, and so uh, we pledged that on now the great thing about a pledging early is that there was nothing to give I had no employees I had you know had no profit like no one cared about our equity so it was a pledge and then over time, as it became worth something, we then started giving money away and, and doing that early. And so the Atlassian Foundation has given away $65 million worth of, of dollars, wow. um, 135,000 free licenses, 230,000 hours of our community service for our employees. And so we've got this huge impact. And our foundation has also given away money globally. Like we believe that you know, philanthropy isn't just about where your employees yeah. live and sit. It's like, actually, how can you do good in the world? And so we sponsored a whole bunch of things, a lot in education, particularly women's education. Uh, Room to Read was a big recipient and they do girls scholarships. So we did a lot in education and women education early. And then about a decade ago, 2014, I looked around and discovered mm -hmm. that we were still one of the very few companies that had done this. Mm -hmm. And I was like, why, why you know, <laughs> We're leading, where is all the people following us? And so I got together with a few other companies 
and uh, we started something called Pledge 1%. Okay. And Pledge 1% tries to evangelize other companies to also take that pledge. And to date, we have now 750 companies here in India wow. have, uh, have taken the pledge and 17,000 companies globally have taken the pledge. And so that is billions of dollars of money through philanthropy that wouldn't have otherwise been given away. And yeah. so uh, really proud about that. And I think we're just getting started because it should be, giving back should be something that every company does and not just when you're old and gray. It should be something that you can, you know, you yeah. can do at every stage. You know, if we had to learn from your 20 years journey, one or two things that you did right to be where you are, what would those be? I think for us, it's having a big vision. Mm. Uh, and our mission is to unleash the potential of every team. And when we looked at that, um, there's a lot of things that change and you can build a company on the next big thing and the, the next greatest like craze. It could be AI, it could be crypto, it could be anything yeah. like that. And we said, no, we're going to focus on a human problem, which is getting people to collaborate better and track work and share knowledge. And ultimately, like our mission will never be done, you know, and least the potential of every team. And so I guess the things I've learned is like, you've got to have a huge vision. And if I went back in time and said, oh, Scott, well, I can do some things differently. I'd say that the times we failed is when we haven't swung big enough, like behind that vision where we've taken really safe bets mm. and i found that when you take safe bets sometimes you lose to other people that are doing the same thing but they're they're swinging for the fences and so if i change something it would be to like take bigger bets along the way what are some of the philosophies uh, that have guided you what are some of the things that have guided you and have kept you in good stead for the one that i've, I've learned relatively recently actually and uh, is that I have a really good friend of mine who, who's also a CEO. And he mm. told me a while ago that as a CEO, you might make a dozen decisions each year that actually make a difference. Um, you may feel like you make a lot of decisions and so forth, but actually when you look back years later, there might be 10 or 12 decisions each year that really change the course of your company. Mm. And when you're a small company, you know, like you, I would work through the night, I would program and have to go get my hands warm. Like I would really, uh, you know, and then I would turn up to work tired and angry and upset and um, realize that I wasn't showing up the best every day. I might've got 10 more emails done the night before or mm. written a bit more lines of code. But when I turned up to work, my employees weren't seeing a leader that they could follow. They were seeing a leader that was tired or angry or had short tempered and I realized that actually I needed to keep myself healthy and happy for those 10 or 12 decisions each year because I don't know when they're coming. Mm -hmm. I can't, I don't know on any given <laughs> day that's going to come, but I need mm -hmm. to make sure that I'm in a great like, state when that happens. And since I've thought about that, I spend a lot more time on being healthy, you know, sleep, diet, exercise, mental health, and making sure that I get breaks and holidays and step away from work and do things that bring me joy because you know a startup there's a lot of a lot of work involved and yeah. sometimes you need to focus on the bits that bring you joy and so since that I, i've spent a lot more time trying to be a better leader and being like making sure that no matter when that like important decision comes i'm in the best frame of mind for it one thing that very few employees at atlassian know about you scott i'm a vegan the best co-founder relationships are driven by I think a shared vision, but uh, separate skill sets. If you were starting up as a founder today, you would? Decide that I wanted to give back early rather than waiting till I'm old and gray. Three problems that you think founders should go after? Not three problems, but I think you should focus on things that don't change. Mm. Uh, many founders do the thing that's the new shiny object, and we focused on unleashing the potential of every team. So. My advice is go find a problem that's not going to change, that's going to be here in 50 years. Scott would respond to a cold email if? They're a member of Pledge 1%. <laughs> uh, the one thing that you walked away with after meeting Prime Minister Modi? We chatted about how Team Anywhere will make a huge difference to rural communities across India. Your view on India 2028? Tech powerhouse. Mm. Your view on Atlassian 2028? Tech powerhouse. <laughs>
your elevator pitch on why India's best engineers should consider working for Atlassian? Two reasons. One is that we have an incredibly strong culture mm. where you'll get to do your best work. And two is that we are building products that get used by millions of people around the world here in India. Your favorite Indian food? Dal. <laughs> Any type of dal. I, I just love it. Yeah, that's vegan. <laughs> Thank you so much. This was, you know, needless to say, but wonderful conversation. I appreciate very, it. very meaningful. And I'm sure everyone has something to take. And more importantly, I think we are taking values and we are taking culture and we are taking uh, meaning from this interview. So thank right. you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. This is fun. <laughs>